Hey, this is Patrick Sullivan. Welcome to my shop. I thought you might like to see what's going on in my shop right now. Follow along with just part of a project that I think will be interesting and will bring together a number of different woodworking skills. Four years ago, my first grandchild was born and I started making stuff for her. Some of it was utilitarian, like a gate for the top of the stairs. Some of it was just silly fun, like pull toys and dump trucks. Then, once I realized that I'd started having children too late in life to see my grandchildren grow up, I began to think about my legacy. Maybe something that might endure. When I was a kid, I had a wooden cigar box that I put my treasures in, like really good rocks and my decoder ring. I thought my granddaughter needed a box too. This is the box I made for her. There's a carved design on the top that includes her initial, and her monogram is inlaid inside in the bottom. The plan is to give it to her when she's five. Then, last year, a grandson was born. Fairness demanded that I make a box for him too. Here's the design for the carved top. It's based on an ancient Celtic drawing but I've adapted it to include the new grandson's initial G. I'm going to cut it out on the scroll saw and then glue it to the top. I decided to make the box from quarter saw and white oak. I've made lots of craftsman furniture from this wood and I really like working with it. It's very hard and very tough, qualities that I thought would be desirable for a boy's box. However, I'll also tell you about some of its negative qualities as we go along. I divided a board into two slices, the top one almost 10 millimeters thick and the bottom sliced 12 millimeters, or close to half an inch. I marked them so I could keep their same orientation when I glued them back together again. Like many of my projects, I developed and refined the drawing on my computer, then scaled it to fit my project, and printed it. This is it. A glue stick is an easy way to paste on the pattern and it does not penetrate into the wood surface. It's the most convenient and simplest way to stick the paper down that I've found. There are 25 interior spaces in this figure, each of which requires an access hole for the scroll saw blade. Some of those holes have to be pretty small. I like to cover both the top and the bottom surfaces with clear packing tape. This reduces scorching and burning as the scroll saw turns tight corners. A smart person would have applied the tape before drilling the holes, but, you know, doing it the hard way builds character. A fresh, sharp number five blade for the saw, tightened up to roughly an A, or maybe an A flat. I quickly discovered that it is considerably harder to scroll saw a thick slab of white oak than I expected. I mean, this is not my first rodeo. I have cut some pretty fancy pieces in my day. However, the prominent grain lines in white oak vary markedly in hardness, making the blade move in fits and spurts, and the blade has some tendency to follow the hard grain lines rather than my lines. At least, those are the excuses I'm gonna to stick to. I, truth be told, I guess I am a little out of practice. A real scroll saw expert could have done this whole cutout with no wiggles or deviations from the lines of any kind. Once the interior parts were cut out, I tried to clean up some of my visible irregularities with some coarse diamond files. Finally, I cut out the exterior outline. Those lines needed a little cleanup as well. However, I can sand the outside right to the lines with my strip sander. Before I got rid of the pattern, I cut through some of the lines that define the crossovers of the shapes that weave over and under each other. Paper pattern comes off easily with a card scraper. I spend a few moments getting the cutout centered on the second oak slice 
keeping the grain orientation exactly the same for both slices. I had an unused foam paint roller that I used to apply the glue. I painted on several layers, allowing some of the glue to absorb into the wood so that the final very thin layer would remain on the surface long enough to form a strong bond with the base. After I dropped the cutout onto the base at my marks, I waited about two minutes for the base to absorb any excess glue. There was no squeeze out at all, I'm happy to report. I let this sit overnight. Once the glue is cured, we're ready to carve. As an insurance policy against careless mistakes, I marked all the crossings with a rough pencil line. This is not a precision cut line. It's just a warning to keep me from cutting the wrong way. It's surprisingly easy to lose track of which part is on top at each crossing, and a mistake with your chisel is hard to recover from. The first cuts are just shallow notches that define the parts that cross each other. Then, when I have a beginning and an end to each segment, I begin a gradual tapering. I want the surface to rise and fall just a little to create the illusion that they are weaving over and under. That's all it takes. My goal with this carving was not to create a highly realistic deep relief. It's not necessary. These Celtic designs hinge on a powerful kind of visual trickery. I just wanted an illusion of roundness to the shapes and a clear definition of which part was uppermost at each crossing. If done right, the mind's eye fills in the missing volume and creates the 3D effect based on just a few clues. Carving white oak is both a pleasure and a pain. It cuts cleanly, provided your tools are razor sharp. Pretty sharp doesn't cut it. Honing the edge after about 15 minutes of steady work with one tool pays dividends. You have to read the grain carefully. If you cut the wrong way, even briefly, you run a large risk of tear out. Compared to carving some nearly grainless woods like say basswood or poplar or pine, this oak is fairly unforgiving. This is particularly true as you follow curves. On many tightly curved edges, you'll have to divide the cut into two parts that meet in the center. The best tactic is to take very thin shavings, similar to the papery curls that come out of a finish plane. Don't get greedy or impatient and try to hog out large chunks. Oh, and for people with vision like mine, wearing a visor magnifier over regular glasses makes a huge difference. This design is not very forgiving either. All the lines need to be what shipbuilders call fair. The eye can easily spot tiny variations in the shape of these curves. The difference between curves that look right and those that have a flat spot or a bump can be the thickness of a sharp pencil line. As a result, after the basic carving is done, there will inevitably be some final tuning of the lines. Despite my efforts to be meticulous and careful, this carving contains tool marks and small errors that I can see up close. I don't care. This is a handmade object, and all the small flaws are the proof that it was not turned out by a CNC machine. By the time my grandson grows up, Handmade woodwork of this sort might well be a rarity. I decided to put in an ebony eye. I turned a tiny dowel to fit with a slight taper so that it would snug up tight. I chose not to leave the chisel marks visible. You know what that means. That means sanding and scraping. I made some special scrapers, like this little tool, but found them of limited use on the oak. Most of the finished work is done with sandpaper, and most of it has to be done by hand, or more accurately, by fingers. 
For some places, your fingers are just too thick and clumsy. The answer is to create a number of little sanding blocks that are each size to handle a specific area. Here are a few of the sanding aids that I made for the job. Different widths, different contours. Big enough to get a good grip on, but with very small sanding areas. There is one trick that allowed me to take advantage of power tools. I made several devices that I will call flap sanders for lack of a better name. You can see one that I built for use with a power drill. It's nothing more than a bunch of layers of 400 grit sandpaper strips held onto a bolt with a nut and a washer. Incidentally, this only works with extremely fine sandpaper. Used broadly over the whole carving, it removes minor surface blemishes, smooths the surfaces, and softens the edges just a little. I like the effect this gives for this particular project. You can run the drill both forward and backward so the strips rotate into narrow angles. Although this flap sander looks blunt and clumsy, you can actually direct which areas get the bulk of the sanding surprisingly well. However, I also made two versions of the sander for use on my Dremel tool. I did one in 400 grit and one in 600 grit. They're only about 30 to 35 millimeters wide, or inch and a quarter to inch and a half, and allow much more precise positioning. I bought a package of these little mandrels online for a trivial amount of money, and they work okay. The little screw at the end, however, is shorter than I'd like, limiting the number of strips of sandpaper that you can employ. I think a small machine screw that will fit in a Dremel collet would actually result in a better sander. The 600 grit does not remove a visible amount of wood. Instead, it functions more as a burnisher, leaving a gleaming surface behind. There's a delightful feel when you run your hand over it. Polished surface is easy to see in person, but it's a little hard to photograph. Hopefully, if I wiggle this enough, you'll get a sense of nice polish. Ultimately, I will build a box and incorporate this piece as the top. I'll also put in a monogram inlay in the bottom piece. If there's any interest, I might make another video in the future showing the completion of the project. Now listen, I don't expect the Smithsonian to call me anytime soon, begging me to put this in their permanent collection. However, my hope is that it will make a box with enough personality and charm that this boy will hold on to it for a few years after I'm gone, and that it'll bring back a few memories of his sainted grandfather. That's all for today. If you like this video, click the like button, and consider subscribing to see more. Thanks for watching.